Thank you so much, and good morning again. Uh, I think uh, if you look at the house of Anita Dongri, it really needs no introduction. It's one of those rare uh, houses in fashion from India that has really gone global and done a lot. Anita Dongri started off very young and had a passion to try and uh, not just build a business, but also look at the maker, the consumer, and the planet. I think that's been her focus, and she's been living, uh, breathing, and working in the area of sustainability for ve very many years. People like Hillary Clinton and uh, the, the Duchess of Cambridge and many others have worn her clothes. Her designs have been around the world, and she employs 2,500 people directly. Apart from that, many artisans are supported by her organization uh, in an indirect way. She's a lover of dogs and a vegetarian. Yash is uh, a person who studied in the United States of America and decided to work with the House of Anita Dongri. How are these two going to look at the future? Of course, the past is what we're going to talk about today, but I'm also interested to know that, and especially from Yash, who's the business head. So let's go straight across now and have the views of Anita and Yash. Welcome, Amin Anita. Welcome. Thank you Thank so you. much for that very, very kind introduction. Well, let me tell you, it's a very interesting uh, panel today because uh, uh, you are mother and son on the one side, and I'm father and daughter on the other <laughs> side. Oh, my God, yes. More, more by accident than design. <laughs> and if I were to strike uh, uh, a, a balance, and well, that's the way it is. But there is, a, there is a twist to that. You are working in the same business. And Sachi and I never worked together except for this. But this is perhaps the first time <laughs> that we're sitting on the same panel. And we're working uh, on, on a panel together. So we're going to co-host you and uh, try and explore and find out uh, all about how you made it and where you're taking this business. But since we started with family, let me, let me start with that area. Uh, you're a very family-oriented person, Anita. You started out young. Uh, as a woman entrepreneur, you built the business. And you brought in your sister and your brother and now the next generation, Yash. How important is family for you? And uh, this is a very pertinent question for many people today who are wondering whether a family business is, is still relevant and how relevant is it and how one should uh, work a family business to make it a success. Uh, Vikram, it started with me and my younger sister, and I know that there's a lot of family that works with me, but today uh, the company is completely professionally managed, and I really don't look at this as a family business anymore. I'm just grateful that I have Yash, who's my son, who is working and taking my vision ahead. So there's ob obviously this great sense of uh, uh, pride, and you know, he's, he's been so close to me. He's come to work since he was literally a one-year-old baby. I used to take him along in a little basket to work and he's born and brought up seeing my workers, born and brought up with my tailors, my carigars. He's been such a large part of my, uh, my struggling years and he's seen it all. And the fact that he wants to take this vision ahead and the fact that he shares my value system of course makes me really proud. But today the company is totally, completely managed by professionals. We have a CEO and Yash in fact reports to the CEO and not to me. And, um, and, and, and I think that's the only way forward for any company today is, is to have the best of professionals in the business. Though the founding, you know, it is a family business founded by us, but I really see, of course, Yash together with the team of able professionals taking the vision ahead. But I'm still going to ask you, Yash, is it difficult working for your mother? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, it's been a very seamless uh, transition into the business because like she said, I've been growing up around the business since my toddler years and then even later on in my teen years, I used to frequent the office very often. Um, so, uh, so, you know, to understand the dynamics of the family business, I, I kind of caught on to that quite early in, uh, in life. And then, uh, you know, once I formally entered the company, 
like she said, uh, we've been running the company professionally from, uh, from, from the start, you know, and we've always tried to just increase that uh, level of professionalism every year. So by the time I joined uh, pro uh, officially post my uh, uh, post graduation in, in, in the US, uh, you know, we already had a very se uh, able senior management in place. So I did start, uh, you know, like any other uh, employee. So I remember I initially started as an intern when I was uh, in my early 20s. And, uh, and then I took some time off to study. And, uh, and when I came back, I was given various um, roles, you know, uh, in different, different areas to kind of learn the, uh, the ins and outs of the business. Um, and I did grow like any other employee would grow. And, uh, and, and, and now I, you know, have the good fortune of uh, the, uh, the role of leading the entire Anita Dongre brand and also driving the international expansion. So the growth has been uh, organic for me. Um, you know, so I think when we do enter the workspace, the, the boundaries are very clear. Uh, so yeah. well at home, you know, it's, it's family and it's very casual, but when we enter the workplace, then everyone respects their role and their designation. So that's a very interesting point and, you make. You've and compartmentalized that really helped. it. Yes, 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 very well. Very, very yeah. well done. I think that's a, that's a good way to go. But Anita, tell me, when you started out, uh, who inspired you? Because I, at, at that time when you started out, I guess it was not so easy for a girl to just come up and say, listen, I want to start a business. You must have had some role model in, in mind. You must have had support from somebody. Vikram, I didn't really have a role model in mind, but this burning, burning desire to be economically independent and to build a fashion house. I had that vision when I was 15. It was just my desire that I wanted to, I just wanted to, to, to be able to run this large business. And I imagined it always to be large, even though I started with two sewing machines in my balcony. Mm. I knew those were just baby steps I'm taking towards something larger. So I would just say that it, had a, it was a dream I had and today I'm living the dream and I do know that I have a long way to go. And the only way forward is, like I said, is to, is to, is to hire the best and get the professionals to take your vision forward. But uh, I always had a large vision. When you started out, you obviously were very focused on making money, on making the two ends meet. That's with every entrepreneur. Uh, when is it that you actually started thinking beyond that towards conscious uh, living and conscious uh, uh, production? Because obviously there must be, have been some turning point where you had the spare money and said, okay, now I will, I will turn more conscious. I will not worry so much about just making two ends meet. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think there was a turning. There was one turning point, but I don't think it had anything to do with money. When I did that turning point, it was more emotion. I, I work with my heart, Vikram. Um, I, I, I'm not that good with, uh, with the mind as, as I am with the heart. Everything just comes from within and I do it. Whatever I've done at work has always been from the heart. I've always worked with craftsmen in Jaipur because I'm, my grandparents are from there. So I've always been, I had a different upbringing, you know, a Bombay girl typically doesn't get an upbringing what you get in a city like Jaipur. So I was a born brought a Bombay girl, but my roots were Jaipur and spending so much quality time there and, uh, you know, understanding artisanal work in Jaipur was key for my, in my childhood. Eight years ago, the turning point, I think, for me was when I visited Gujarat and I visited Ila Ben's um, NGO called uh, Seva, which has more than 20 lakh women from India. And that visit just blew me off because it just blew me to another level because I couldn't, you know, it just made me understand that the power of rural India and what we as designers need to do today to empower the rural woman and how hungry the rural woman was to get empowered. And, and that is going to be a game changer for our country and, and how craft can be used to actually drive, uh, drive this economic independence in rural India. So when I visited with Seva and I saw what they are doing with the women and how they're inspiring women in every, every state of the country to, to take their traditional crafts that they learned from their mothers to, to, to use that now for economic independence is for me was the game changer. And that's when my work grassroots was born eight years ago and that's when I truly di deep dived into taking my work to provide employment in rural India. Yes, and you also gave the artisans uh, the center stage, so to speak. You they make, deserved you, it. You made them walk the ramp. They deserved it. These are women with amazing confidence and an amazing ability to want to change their lives. 
And I think if today you go into work and you design a garment and that design is uplifting a community, there can be nothing more empowering than that for you as a person and just for the community too. So that's so what drives me, you know. You just spoke about craft here and I want to take a question on craft. Um, you've been working with Pichwai paintings, you've been mm. working in the Gota Pati, with Gota Pati and a lot of other local mm. crafts. Mm. Um, fashion is such a seasonal business, so how do you keep craft relevant to the after season? It's a very, very good question and it's a, it's a very, very tough act. Now, when I work with the ladies of Seva, when you work with a lot of craft, because it's really, really slow fashion at its best, you could be sending in a batch of clothes for embroidery to Seva and they won't come in the two months stipulated period that you want them to come. They'll maybe come after four months. And that's when you learn to design craft in a more classic manner, in a seasonless manner. So I, I'm, I'm a big, big advocate of seasonless fashion to a certain extent. I know Delhi has a winter and of course, but still you can style so many garments and wear them throughout the year. So craft, I think, has to be classic, has to be seasonless because you, you, don't, you, can, you have to work at the, at the pace, at the way the craftsperson work because these are not machines, these are hands, actual hands doing your work. So it's very interesting. I find that challenging. I find working with those limitations also extremely challenging. It's exciting also. And Yash, on the business end of uh, things, uh, do you find that a challenge as well to match up with the pace of a craftsman and create to give some, the audience something uh, new every time with the... So the challenges are similar like how they have on the design front, right? Uh, there is, uh, I mean, you have to be patient with them because, uh, you know, unlike uh, professional, you know, factories or manufacturing units, uh, you know, they are capabilities. I mean, they're very talented, but, uh, you know, for the, for the quality output, you have to work in a slower pace. So I think we've already accounted for those uh, metrics in the business model as well, you know, and, and, and the more it gets seasonless, it gets a lot easier on the business front as well, because then you're not uh, pressured with, uh, you know, launches like every month, you know, you can, you know, if there is a delay, you can push that to say three months down the line or four months down the line, and it won't really won't affect your uh, uh, your marketing or your or the business side of things. So it's it's been a long journey because you know we started uh, grassroots now uh, over six years. seven years ago seven to, seven, eight, seven to eight years ago. So it's been a huge learning curve, and we have so obviously in in, in the initial few years it was a lot harder, but we managed to you know overcome those difficulties, and I think we've kind of figured out our model now. And it, is, it seems to be working well. How big a challenge is sending the message across that it is worth spending those extra bucks to buy something sustainable? Is that a challenge? I think the right consumer who appreciates that comes to you. When mm. you sell craft or when you sell sustainability, I think the media plays a very important role then to change the mindset of the client. But as brands, I, you know, I rather, I, we, we wait for those women who appreciate that to come to you. And I think the more media and talks about it and the more you have conferences like this and the more people start understanding sustainability, education is extremely important. And I think that's the role the media plays. We as the brand do try, but... Uh, Just to add to that, uh, so typically, as we know, global trends sort of are born in the West, in the Western markets, and then they kind of lead their way into the Eastern markets. Uh, and I still feel that is true even today, even though we're living in a lot more globalized world now. But uh, I was just reading an article where in the US, uh, over 60% of consumers are now uh, uh, being influenced in their shopping uh, decisions uh, by uh, sustainability uh, as, a, as a requirement. So they are looking at buying, uh, they are looking at asking the questions, okay, is my product uh, impacting the environment in, a, in the right way or the wrong way? You know, if I'm buying this, you know, what is the benefit I am, you know, uh, doing to the environment or to the uh, local economy. So, uh, so, so if in the US it's already over 60% uh, consumers are being influenced by these decisions when they're shopping, I think that, I mean, it's nowhere close right now in India, but that, will, that trend will come here. You know, it may take five years, it may take six years, but it will eventually come. And I think we've already seen that happening in the last couple of years. You know, you have so many homegrown labels uh, propping up. We've seen some great, uh, uh, labels, you know, in your exhibition here, and I think that's just going to grow tenfold in the years to come. And I think, and I think we are the early adopters. I think it's the market is still growing. It's, it's a, a good trend, trend. and it, I don't think it'll just stay a trend. I think it'll become the norm because I think with the millennials and the Gen Z, 
generation today uh, it's it's a matter of survival right i mean uh, if you don't act now then you know what are you going to leave to your children in the future there is no planet b exactly <laughs> <laughs> let's talk of the international side since you mentioned it you actually went overseas and set up a store yes uh, long back what drove you to go overseas most people who were successful in india were quite happy uh, staying in India, exporting from here, and uh, perhaps uh, growing their market share within the country. But you decided, no, we must go overseas. And that, that uh, gave you an edge over many people. You actually went out and uh, swam the oceans, as they say. Yeah, what, what drove you to that? My investors are going to hate this answer. The heart wanted a store <laughs> in New York, and the, <laughs> and the woman went and did that, and that's it. <laughs> In fact, Yash was the one who headed the New York store and did a great job of it. I just wanted a store in New York because I just think it was really, really high time that Indian designers took pride in... I, it was like, why is there no Indian designer in, in, in New York? It was just that, you know. I really wanted to be the first one to go there and, and... I'm really proud of what I make and I think we make such beautiful, beautiful clothes. I mean, all Indian designers, I think we're so, so talented and why are we just a manufacturing hub? Why can't we take our labels there? Yash, you were obviously the right person at the right place yeah. at the right time. You'd probably finished your master's, you were sitting Correct. in New York, you knew the environment, and uh, you had Anita tell you, go ahead and open a store. How difficult was it? Because obviously, uh, you probably didn't have the vast experience Correct. of the market. And then the other question was, uh, not many Indians had done such a thing. So was it a big challenge for you? It was definitely a big challenge. And like she said, it was pure, a pure passion project, right? So I even um, really appreciate the investors and the board for giving me that, uh, that opportunity because, you know, for me, a young grad student just out of college, uh, they may not have, you know, it was not easy for them to, to, be, to have that uh, hope that I would be able to pull that off, right? Uh, but I did uh, move there in 2017, um, literally just packed my bags from here. I returned from college 2016, so I spent a year in India and then packed my bags again and moved back to New York. And while I studied there, you know, working there is very different. Uh, you know, uh, that's always the case. That's I think always the case. Yeah, because you don't pay your bills uh, when you're a student. <laughs> you don't pay your bills, and also, uh, you know, uh, to, to to be able to understand, uh, New York is a real, real challenging city to to, to make it in, in a big way, right? Because it's firstly very expensive, and to get your way around is very difficult. So I think uh, literally going there and starting from scratch, and literally everything from you know setting up a company uh, to Eventually, when the store came up, you literally, you know, steam pressing the ro your own garments and, and then hanging them on the racks because, you're, you know, there you don't have the help that you have in India, right? So, you're literally, uh, you know, you're, you're cleaning as well as you're being the CEO of that business. So, uh, it, it definitely was a great journey. And I think uh, when, we re when we really, that, that dream was really realized when we, you know, when you open the store and in the f within the first few months, uh, you know, it definitely was received very well and we had you know, customers from all over the country, uh, of course, all Indian. across the East Coast, a lot of basically the Indian diaspora because, you know, it's such a large community there in the U.S., you know, flocking to the store. And I remember this incident, this, in, this instance where one um, uh, lady, you know, stood outside the store for almost five or seven minutes before she actually walked in, just like looking up at the, at the signboard because she was just, she couldn't get over the fact that she was weeping. She, mm. she had tears in eyes because yeah, she couldn't she get over the fact weeping, that there was an yeah. Indian uh, brand in the heart of Soho in New York City, you know, wow. because generally over there... Um, I was there, yeah, and she came and gave yeah. me a hug and I got so emotional and she just hugged me and she said, you know something, I feel so proud standing here to see an Indian sign on Broadway. And, and then that day, I think it, real, it hit me that what I had done was, was quite crazy, but, you know, I had done something that... Because she was so, so emotional about it. Because you're the first organized uh, retail company to uh, from India to have a, a brick and mortar presence there. Otherwise, you had a very informal mom and pop sort of uh, uh, market there, uh, which was more in the uh, Indian dominant neighborhoods of say New Jersey and then in the West Coast uh, outside of LA. Uh, but no one really had done something like this uh, in the city itself, uh, you know, and, and, and again, Soho being one of the uh, most sought after fashion destinations in the city after Fifth Avenue and Madison. So. So yeah, definitely it was a, it was a moment of uh, uh, great pride for us. Uh, and of course, while I was there, you know, a lot of challenges uh, building the business, a lot of learnings because, um, you know, consumers 
are different over there, so their needs, their wants are different. Um, consumer side of things, in fact, this was the next question I was uh, yeah. coming to. Uh, how much different was your audience there as compared to the audience you catered to here? And specifically when it comes to sustainability, to craft, to understanding quality, to understanding, uh, you know, what that design means and what the brand holds, the value of brand holds. Um, how much of that was it, a, was it a challenge when you went to so for us, uh, fortunately, we weren't taking a very uh, new product over there, right? It was basically taking the Anita Dongri existing product and marketing it to there because we were very clear we want to target the Indian diaspora and the South Asians in the US. Uh, we weren't looking at a very large market over there. So from a fashion sensibility point of view or design sensibility point of view, there was there was not issue, there were not many issues. But uh, it is definitely a price sensitive market. So, you know, you have to be respectful of that because just because you are opening a store outside of India, you cannot uh, have crazy markups and, you know, on your pricing because uh, uh, the, the, the Indian consumer there is very well informed. It's and now it's to what most people would think. Yeah, and now it's social media and the, and the online e-commerce uh, booming, you know, price trans transparency has increased uh, hugely. And then, you know, a lot of people have family back home, so they know exactly, you know, what your product is priced back home. So you have to be very respectful to that and you have to make sure you price it in a way where it's not unaffordable or unattainable for the consumer there, you know. Uh, so that's what we did. We made sure just, you know, we, we cover our landing costs and we, you know, we cover the, uh, the tax and duty parts of the whole uh, the process, but we don't overprice it for that consumer there because they are uh, price conscious definitely over there. Anita, one of the ways that you shot to the line, you came in the limelight, you shot to fame, was that you dressed many uh, high profile people. Your designs were worn by Hillary Clinton, and uh, uh, the Queen and, uh, of uh, your European country. So, so, Belgium, so, the Queen of, of Belgium. Belgium. Belgium, that's right. So how is it that you got these people and who was your first? I think the very first royalty was, of course, Kate Middleton. And I just think that all these women, all of them who've worn me, they all have a style that is, uh, that is the brand's design voice, which is as feminine, as elegant. So I think when they came to India, they were looking at who, you know, to buy, and we have a very, very, very well-informed uh, website. They just chose, they chose the design because it resonated with their personal sense of style, which is elegant, no, But are you simple. telling me that they actually came to you through your website? Most of them, yes. You didn't go out and get them? We no. didn't have any big global agency kind of pitching to them or anything. Nothing. <laughs> no. no, it, it all happened very organically. So your suggestion Kate today, Middleton stylist bought it through my website. And the Queen of Belgium? The Queen of Belgium, we got an email from the palace, yes, but it's all on, on email and... They're and reaching out to us. They're reaching out to us. Okay, but the list is pretty long. If you want, I can go one by one. <laughs> you can. <laughs> because I think... And similarly, even with Hillary, uh, you know, Huma Aberdeen reached out to us at the time. Um, yes. And, and it, it all happened She came to the New York store. So I just think... Isn't that lovely? I think the design language resonates with their sense of style, which is a simplicity, femininity, and elegant and sustainable, and that's what it is. And do you believe in luck? I definitely <laughs> believe in luck and destiny too, Vikram. So there you are. <laughs> there you are. So... Uh, Yash, do you believe in luck? Yeah, definitely. I think. Uh, but you luck work hard. coupled with a lot, with a lot of, of hard, hard work. Of hard work. I'm not yeah, denying the hard luck work. Luck and destiny. I think everyone. Uh, you know. I mean, he mobbed the New York store floor. I'm really proud of that. Right. <laughs> right. Anita, you've scaled in an absolute male-dominant industry, and a lot of women look up to you. <laughs> uh, what were your challenges scaling, and what would you want to tell? specifically the women out there who aspire to be uh, a big brand, what would you like to tell them? So my challenges were that nobody took me seriously. And my challenges were that sometimes, so my biggest challenge was that sometimes I had these large dreams, but I probably sometimes my, doubted my own self. So today what I'd like to say to every, every young woman out there who dreams big is that just believe in your dreams and go, go and chase them and make them happen because you can make them happen. Because I think as women, we ourselves sometimes are our worst enemies. Where we can have these large dreams where we just feel that I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be able to make this happen. You are, you can and you will. If I can, so can everybody else. So just believe in yourself. But Anita, you're also a risk taker, aren't you? You, you took a risk when uh, 
very young, in fact, when you were supplying your uh, garments to a certain shop or chain, and they refused something, and you decided, all right, if they don't take it, I will start my own store. And that was a risk, wasn't it? Because it wasn't a risk. It's belief in yourself. So you don't you 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 don't think it's a risk to actually venture out and sometimes go and. Uh, I think when you believe so hard in something that you want, you're just going to make it happen. That is not a risk. You just mm -hmm. believe in it and you want to do it and you go there and you make it happen. And uh, when you take these decisions, what is the formula that you use in your mind, apart from, of course, uh, conviction that you will succeed, you are right, is there any other formula you use? Do you consult with people? Do you uh, actually form an opinion after working very hard on, on the idea. How, how do you actually come to that decision? I've said this before. I think I use, I use design. I use intelligence with empathy. I think I'm a designer who works with empathy. Mm -hmm. I understand women. I, I, I understand and I, I, I'm, just, I'm somebody who's a facilitator who's kind of just creating something because I know that's what women want. I put myself in their shoes. Mm -hmm. And I use, use, my, use my designing capability, technology, whatever you can say to be able to do that. I think, I think empathy is important. So and what is it that you're currently now looking at? What are the new uh, ideas that you have? I am today just actually deep diving into how can I do whatever I do better. And that's mm. something what I work on every day. You know, if I'm creating a garment, if I'm doing this, how do I cut this garment with less wastage? What am I doing with the wastage? How is that wastage being recycled? Which NGO is it going to? What is, it, what is happening? So today the company has reached a stage where all our fabric wastage is given to NGOs. Those are recycled into quilts, quilts that are donated to, to anything, to scrunchies, to anything. I just hate waste of any kind. So I'm tackling the waste in the organization currently. I'm tackling um, where, where are we buying all our fibers and materials from? How can I buy that sustainably? I just finished tackling all our packaging. We, we, you know, we reconverted all the packaging to a sustainable packaging. There's just so much to do, Vikram. Yeah. I mean, I know sustainability is a buzzword, but every little step, and I can do better and better every day. So it, it's a constant learning. I'm today a learner. I'm, I'm reading up. I'm learning. I'm questioning. So for everything, we are looking at how do we do this better, guys. So the, whole the first time I interviewed you, in fact, now you talk about empathy with Indra Bali. Hmm. Uh, your, your Our design, design headquarters. Design headquarters there, and I distinctly remember I was uh, 23, writing my first book that time, and you told me I'm living the dream here, and I remember looking at that environment, absolutely green and beautifully done outside, um, outside Mumbai, Nami Mumbai. Could you walk me through as why you built uh, the headquarters there, and what Prabali and your headquarters really stands for? So I um, always wanted to build a design headquarters that was, uh, that was environmentally and scientifically created to conserve energy. So we recycle all our water there. It's designed in a manner. I didn't take a LEED certificate, but it pretty much has, you know, we've ticked all the boxes that we can do. It was just a dream, again, to work from a very, very beautiful place. It faces these beautiful hills. You've been there. I call it my green building there. And it just makes me happy to go work there because it's, um, it's, it's, um, yeah, it is a beautiful space, and I think it's important to work from a beautiful space. Well, what struck me as interesting, though I haven't been there when I read up on it, was the fact that you uh, adopted the dogs uh, who were in the area, yeah, yeah. and you look after them and as, as uh, uh, co-tenants, so to speak, that they have as much rights as you in that area. We do. We're an animal-loving family, not just dogs. So we, we have eight dogs, which were the, you know, uh, which came with the, with the plot of land that we got. We have two at home again, which came with, with the plot of land that we got there. So I just think that um, we all just need to be mindful of, of uh, nature around us. For me, animals are part of nature. And whatever little we as humans can do, because we have the intelligence to do that, is to, to be able to look after them. I mean, that's the least we can do. But at the end so of the, the day... So the foundation also works with a lot of animal charities in and around Bombay. Mm. But at the end of the day, how important is it to maintaining a balance? Because when you're conserving, for example, mm. you don't want to become stingy. No. So that, that's my point. How do you find that fine balance? And, that, and why I'm saying this is because a lot of people tend to uh, uh, relate one with the other. So either you're extravagant or you're stingy. And you know, it's very difficult sometimes when it comes to 
um, sustainability to draw that fine line and walk that fine line? Uh, it, give me an example and then maybe I could reply to this. Like how? Now, when you're, when you're uh, let's say, conserving water, hmm. uh, a lot of people would say, okay, it's very personal. I, I don't know what uh, uh, people would think of this remark, but let me put it across. Uh, if you have a shower twice a day, they say you're wasting water. Hmm. And they say, why don't you have a shower once a day? But if you're playing sport in the evening, you, uh, need, the you need a shower twice yeah. a day. So where do you draw the line, you see? Well, the most sustainable solution is, not, is, is to have a bucket and a tumbler bath, which is what I do every single day. I mm. don't have a shower. Yeah. I'm so that's what I the mean. The bucket and tumbler girl yeah. saves water. I'm very, very conscious about water because, you know, I, my biggest fear is that the world is going to run out of water. That's Absolutely. one of my biggest, that, biggest that fears. Mm. I'm the one who's always uh, shutting taps if somebody leaves the tap on while they're brushing their teeth in the, you know, in the house. I'm, I'm actually quite, quite militant about water because I think water is such a precious resource and we all take it so much for granted. So when you work with NGOs or other organizations and you collaborate with them, uh, do you sometimes hit roadblocks where there is a difference in philosophy or, again, that fine line, how they see things? Maybe they are slow, you're fast. Maybe they are fast, you're slow. Maybe they seek uh, sustainability in a slightly different way. Um, and, and, and you see it, uh, and I'll give you an example. For ex you talked about walking the ramp uh, with, with your artists. Uh, that gave them the recognition, but then there's also the question of economic well-being. And uh, maybe somebody will say, how does it matter whether they walk the ramp or not if they don't have uh, economic security at the end of the day? So there are lots of conflicting interests. Hmm. So how do you actually bridge that? You know, I think these are just small issues. I mean, if everyone has their heart in the right place, that's all that counts. The founders and of all pocket the, as well. I mean, you have to have the heart and the yeah, pocket in the right place. All the place. founders of the NGOs I work with, their heart is in the right place. And the, and the artisans walking the ramp, it was something really they wanted. It was their heart's desire to walk the ramp. I was mm -hmm. sitting in the village with them. I'd gone to get the Lakme Fashion Week collection design. And I was telling them, we need to hurry on this. This has a timeline because this is going on a fashion show. So you can't delay it because, you know, the fashion show dates don't change. So I have to get it on time. And they were like, OK, what's a fashion show? I told them. And they were just so curious. And they said, humne to kabhi dekha nahi, humko mm -hmm. aana hai. So I said, and I showed them on a you know, phone, um, the models walking the ramp. They said, humko bhi aana hai, hum bhi ramp pe chalenge. I said, sure. And that's it. It was something they wanted to do. And I just said, sure. And that's how it happened. It gave them a lot of confidence. Yes, and it also gave them a look into uh, the world and life uh, that probably they uh, cater to but don't become part of usually. Yeah. So it's, it's a big plus, undoubtedly. In fact, we, we, we took a whole group of artisans for the New York store launch also. So I want to just talk about technology and how you are trying now to bring in uh, technology and ideas from overseas but yet remaining Indian in the sense that you want to make as much as possible in India. Yes. And you want to get the best of technology into the business as well. How are you managing that? Today, we, we all know that technology plays a huge, huge role in all our lives. And you cannot achieve anything sustainably without technology. Technology plays a huge role, so which is why design and technology are the future, Vikram. Mm. And you, you can't shirk that. And technology can be used for so much good. So in our case, uh, you know, when you talk about even uh, our digital and online presence, I think we, wanna, we were one of the early uh, fashion houses to uh, to launch an e-commerce uh, website. This is back in 2009 or 2010. So it's uh, so our e-commerce journey has been has been long. And and today the way it's evolving is that we've we've decided that we will be best in class with everything to do with technology. Mm -hmm. So we are actually rolling out. Uh, a new website, uh, and I, not not just the website, but the entire digital ecosystem of the company is being overhauled. And in the next uh, two months, we'll be going live with it. And I, I mean, I proudly say it'll be at least in the fashion industry in India. In India, I'm not comparing to globally. I think it'll be the best uh, digital infrastructure that anybody has. Mm. Uh, so, so we are investing very heavily when it comes to technology because, like uh, Anita said. It's the only way to sustain and, and grow in the future because if you do not, if you're not an early adopter of technology, then you will you will die as a business. Mm. How about COVID? Has it affected your business? Has it uh, perhaps uh, left either a short-term or a long-term dent in your business? 
I would say uh, in, in our industry, uh, you know, fashion and retail were one of the industries that were most severely affected. So definitely uh, uh, it has impacted us, but I think everything is short term. I don't think it will really impact us in a long term way. So I think this year, this year has already started off on a strong note. And uh, and if you know if all goes well this year, I think uh, then I think that'll be f that whole chapter will be forgotten. No, but so it was devastating. I don't think it is something yeah. anybody should forget and should ever forget. While we were going through it, it was very very. Yeah. Uh, I mean, very, when very you look tragic. at it, even from the artisans, the way they were impacted. I mean, mm. there were some terrible, terrible moments that I personally went through because I remember calling up. Um, you know, Seva, Reema, Ben, and she told me like there were artisans, my artisans in Gujarat, they didn't have food to eat. Mm. We, we, you know, we did what we could sitting here, but I think, I, I don't think that any of us in this room or anyone should ever forget what we've gone through with COVID. Mm. It's a reminder true. to what us. Uh, industry, what do you think, what were our key lessons to learn as an industry from uh, COVID? Our key lessons are that we all have to make the changes in our life to really, really live more sustainably and to be very, very conscious of all the resources that we have because um, like there is no planet B. So it, it's something none of us should forget ever. It, it should in fact change all our lives and the way we think and the way we work and at least it, it, it's had a huge impact on me in the, in the way I see the future and the way I want to work. There were huge learnings in that. Yasha Anita says that she's now going to concentrate on doing things and doing things better. Of course, Anita, you've been into various areas, women's wear, men's wear, jewelry. Is there something that you want to add to the line, Yash? Spacecrafts or, or something else? I think, I think she's the one full of ideas. I think I'm the execution guy. So, you know, she, she gives out the marching orders and I go ahead and <laughs> roll it out. So whether it was the New York store or whether uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the domestic expansion or whether it's the other uh, uh, territories we're looking to get into in the next few years. I think I just have my plate full in, in, in executing these, uh, these ideas and concepts. So, uh, so I pride myself in execution and... Uh, so the organization keeps you very busy. Keeps I me very busy, definitely. And Anita, I think the organization keeps you thinking. Yeah, I'm the, the dreamer time. and the thinker all the and time. And the doer at the end of the day. You get things done. So I remember yeah. eight years ago uh, when we started looking for our, uh, the, the, you know, looking at moving out of the office to a new office space. And she said, uh, you know, let's, so, so I was tasked to kind of, and I was very young at the time, I, I was tasked to go out and, and look at possible areas to open the office. And then we went out to New Bombay and every weekend I used to go in, uh, you know, with the broker and look at plots of land and buildings. And then we found this building, uh, this, this plot of land actually, which was about, I think, almost one and a half acre. And, you know, at that time, it's very expensive compared to what we could, have, could afford. And, you know, we were looking to build like almost, uh, I think currently we have about 90,000 square feet of office space. So at the time, everyone told her like, you know, you must be crazy. Like, why do you want to take on this massive infrastructure project? You know, we can just move into a smaller office. And, and but she was she stuck to her gut. She said, "No, you know, this is where I feel we will grow. We will, you know, the business will grow to be able to occupy this this office." And and you know, we moved I think six six and a half years ago to this office, and we're already pretty much at full capacity there. And and it wasn't for her uh, vision and dream to you know move to such a big facility. And we would have still been working out of multiple units or offices in Mumbai or you know. I, do, yeah, I just space. didn't want to work out of a grey, grimy building. That's basically. <laughs> I wanted something green and beautiful. Like a sibling thought she was totally crazy when she decided to, you know, buy this big plot of land to build this massive building because they said like, why? <laughs> and what did you think? I actually, I, I mean, he just I'm takes the orders. I did the order, but I, I was, I was <laughs> very excited because for me, you know, being a being a young uh, young person, it just shows the kind of potential that the business has, right? and I've always seen that from day one. Because when I was in very young and her first office, I remember, was in a slum area in Santa Cruz. <laughs> and I remember this vividly. She, she had a cabin and the cabin used to overlook a, a buffalo shed, you know, literally. So, and you had to walk in these small slum alleyways to get to, like, the tailoring unit. And you have to walk another lane to get into the, uh, you know, the, the fabric unit. And it was just Yeah, that's called working at the grassroots level. Working at the grassroots <laughs> level. So, seeing that and then over the years, seeing it grow and then, and then, when she had a dream of moving to this massive facility, I was like very excited. I said, you know, why not? <laughs> well, it's always a pleasure to uh, hear from an Indian company and uh, see an Indian brand go truly multinational. 
Um, I think the future is there, and you have ideas. Anita, Yash, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.